Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's guest, Seth Godin. Seth is an entrepreneur, best-selling author, and speaker who's known for making a ruckus. He's written 19 best-selling books, including Permission Marketing, Tribes, and Purple Cow, and he has the most popular business blog in the world. Seth also runs the Alt-MBA, a four-week online leadership and management workshop, and hosts one of my favorite podcasts, Akimbo. Today, Seth and I dig into his new book, This is Marketing. You can't be seen until you learn to see. We talk about building a tribe, how to earn trust, and the three questions every marketer should ask. Get out your pen and your notepad for this one. Here's my conversation with Seth Godin. So Seth Godin, what a pleasure. You know, I read your daily blog and and sometimes I think, where in the world does this guy come up with all this stuff? It's amazing. And so I'm super excited to dig in today and really just so grateful. As I said before we went on, you make a ruckus and you've changed me because of that. And I know you've changed so many other people. So first and foremost, thank you. Well, that's very kind of you. As you know, showing up all the time uh, is hard sometimes and you're doing it in a room all by yourself so hearing that it's resonating with people in the outside world is terrific thank you for sharing that absolutely well thank you so you started an email newsletter in 1991 and it evolved into your daily blog so i wanted to ask you first why did you start it and why do you keep going i started it because the people in my extended family and friends thought i was uh, a failure i have an MBA, but I didn't have a job. I was a creator, a freelancer, an inventor with a long string of projects that didn't work very well. And I felt like sharing with people the way I was seeing the world, talking to them about what I thought was going to happen next would be helpful to them. And over time, it grew into Yo-Yo Dine, which was um, the first email marketing company. And After that, I thought, wait, you mean I get to put things into the world without the pain and suffering of writing a book? Sure, (laughs) sign me up for that. (laughs) And you've written plenty. You've written plenty. And we're going to talk about your new one today. This is marketing, and I'm excited to dig into that. You know, how have you been able to balance being your brand and scaling your business? Well, I'm not trying to scale my business, so it makes it easier. But you do. You see, I only have a couple employees, right? And um, I will have run projects that become things unto themselves. Okay. So the Alt MBA, for example, right. now has ninety coaches. We have students in uh, over forty countries, but I'm not in it. It's not my business. Mm-hmm. It's an institution that I created, but I'm not in it. So when I think about how I spend my day. I'm not trying to find readers for my writing. I'm trying to find writing for my readers. And it's okay with me if I don't have good SEO. And it's okay with me if I don't have clickbait. Because that's not the goal. The goal isn't to reach everyone. The goal is to make an impact for people. And make change. Sure. So you've never gone into it and said, how can I make this bigger? You've gone into it always saying, and I've read every one of your books, how can I make change? How can I make an impact? Because if you want to make it bigger... Mm -hmm. Then you're saying to yourself, either I have to tell a different story or you have to say I have to bring assets and resources to bear to shift the culture faster than it would shift organically. Mm -hmm. And those are fine things to do. I mean, I don't don't bemoan or criticize Howard Schultz from when he took over Starbucks, there were two or maybe three of them to however many tens of thousands he has. That's what he set out to do. But the thing that has made Starbucks better over the last five years has not been that Starbucks is better. It's just that it's easier to get to a Starbucks. That (laughs) that 
that's the axis that they're growing on, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you can choose that axis. Or you can choose the axis of the writer, of the person who works in a studio, of the person who has ideas, or the freelancer. And that axis is, how can I become the one that would be even harder for someone to replace? How can I become the one who becomes an integral part of who people are and where they're going? Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, that has always appealed to me. I want to jump right into your book because there's so much here, Seth, and there's so much in all of your books. So This Is Marketing is the name of the book, and you define marketing, and so I want to dig into this, as the act of making change happen. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, most definitions of marketing fall down because they talk about some of the tactics of marketing, that you're running an ad or you're designing a product, but they don't explain what marketing is for. Mm. What marketing is for, the only thing it's for is to make change. Now, maybe you're trying to turn non-customers into customers. Maybe you're trying to turn customers to buy five things into 10 things. Maybe you're trying to turn the person you're negotiating with into someone who's going to offer your client $2 million instead of a million dollars. But all of those actions require someone changing their mind or changing their behavior. Mm -hmm. And we hesitate to talk about this because it's frightening. It's frightening to take that responsibility. That I, what are you here for? I'm here to make a change happen. Really? What kind of change? Because if the change isn't in the interest of the recipient, the recipient is going to say, get lost. I don't want you to change me into that kind of person. Mm-hmm. If some of the people who built the addictive parts of Facebook had been honest, they would have said, my job is to turn people from happy folks who use social media a few minutes a day into frantic and anxious ridden people who are checking social media seven hours a day. Mm -hmm. That's what they worked on. Mm -hmm. But making it that clear makes it hard to go to work because you're not doing it for the user, you're doing it for yourself. And so that's still marketing though. Marketing is the act of making change happen, changing the culture, changing our world. And so Seth, when you write and when you market and when you think about marketing is a better way to ask that question. When you think about marketing and you think about the things that you push out, which is incredible content consistently for free, oftentimes, sometimes. Do you spend time thinking about the heads and the hearts of the people you want to connect with? Or do you think about the things that are coming up for you in your life and what you feel like you can share that can make potentially someone else's life better? And so that's why you share it. It's very tempting to believe that we're doing work for everyone. But I've never met a marketer who's doing work for everyone. If you're successful, you're doing work for someone, a very specific set of someone's. And so we begin by understanding that you have to have at least a little bit in mind about who you're seeking to change. So the simple example is, I do not write my blog in Italian. And since I don't write it in Italian, I've already eliminated people who only speak Italian from Mm -hmm. the group I'm trying to change. Well, I can get more and more specific, right? So people who love the status quo, who don't want their world to change, who are totally satisfied, I'm not writing for them doesn't make me any sense for me to write for them. It's not for you. Mm-hmm. So I keep boiling it down and boiling it down and boiling it down. When I m- interact with something, when I learn something, when I see something in the world, I say to myself, the person I'm writing for, will they benefit from hearing this? Will they benefit from knowing this? And if the answer is yes, then I am more likely to share it than if the answer is no. So if it's just about me, if it's I got pissed off at this software company because they did this to me. I'm not going to blog that because it's not about my reader. It's about me, and that wouldn't be helpful. Got it. Yep, yep. So you do get in the heads and the hearts so that you can deliver content that it's about them, not you. Heads and hearts is tricky for me. Maybe I would say I think about what they dream of and what they want. Mm -hmm. I think about their narrative that they tell themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, that might be what heads and hearts actually are, but- I guess I'm approaching it with a little bit more MBA mindset that says, I don't care about the noise in your head as much as I care about the external actions that someone sitting next to you could notice about how you behave. So how, when you write, how do you assess when something can become a book? Yeah, well, it doesn't work that way for me. Okay. So I've done, this is my 19th book. Yeah. And they're painful. They're (laughs) And they've gotten much, much more. feel your pain, man. I love writing them. Writing them is my favorite part. It's after that, when you've made a promise to the publisher or 
expended resources and you have warehouses and piles of paper and you have to all that stuff. That's the cost to me, not the benefit. So I only turn something into a book when I have no choice. I don't say, oh, I haven't done a book in a while. It's time to do a book. I used to do that before the internet made it easy to share an idea because I eagerly waited for the year to roll around so I could write a new book. But that's, I've been over that for a long time. Now I say, if I can get away with a blog post or a medium post or even an online seminar, I'll do that because I love all those things. But if I have no choice, if the idea will not let me go until there's a book, then I'll make a book. And so when you say it won't let you go, tell me about that. Well, so with, with This Is Marketing, the new book, yeah. I've been talking to people. I don't coach, but I give free advice to people I like and to nonprofits. And I've been helping people think about marketing for 30 years. And about two years ago, I said, I'll make an online seminar for those people. And it's called The Marketing Seminar. And 6,000 people have taken it. We're doing it again in January. And it works. It works really well. But, it's a big but, a whole bunch of people said, I don't have 100 days to spend. And a whole bunch of people said, I don't have $600 to spend. So we made a Udemy course that doesn't have as much impact because it's not interactive, but there's all the lessons, and that's 200 bucks. And some people said, yeah, but I really like to read. So for those people, and there's hundreds of thousands of them, I'm saying for the kind of person that needs to explore an idea in a book, who wants to take their time or speed through it, who wants to have something they can hand to 10 people they work with and say, let's all read this because it's going to change us. Here's that artifact. And yes, I could say to people, just read my blog. There's 7,000 posts. You'll figure it all out. (laughs) But this is sort of a service for people who don't want to do that. Got it. Okay. I get it. I get it. You know, in This Is Marketing, you ask three really simple, which is what I love about your work. It's you ask three really simple yet powerful, powerful questions that marketers should ask. You ask, What change are you trying to make? What promise are you making? And who are you seeking to change? Can you walk me through that a little bit? Sure. So we talked a little bit about what change. And the more specific you are, the better. Uh, So in the case of Apple Computer, the change they have sought to make until about five years ago was to turn people into folks who have better taste about digital products. That if you touch a Mac or an iPhone, your standard for what good taste is goes up. And if they could keep that cycle moving uh, toward good taste, their business problems would be solved. The second question is, who are you trying to change in the sense of you can't change everyone, as we talked about with people who don't speak English and are living in Italy. And then the third one is, okay, well, I get who I'm changing. Now, this change I'm trying to make, how will I know if I'm keeping my promise? How can I be really clear to myself and to other people about what interaction we're having and the change we're making? Now, I need to be really clear here. This is not a slogan. This is not a headline. So, you know, if you think about um, a company like Supreme, which is the luxury good out of New York that sells radically overpriced T-shirts and other items with their logo on it, when you buy a Supreme hat for $45, What's the promise? Well, I don't think the promise is this will give you shade and you will not get a sunburn (laughs) on your head because you can, you can solve that problem for $4. So what's the extra 40 bucks for? Well, the extra 40 bucks is I think two parts. One, when you buy one of these items, you will feel satisfied and proud of yourself because you got something scarce that you got to put an effort into buying it in a world of one click shopping. You own a prize. And number two, when you wear this hat, a certain kind of person will look at you with esteem. A certain kind of person will think more highly of you simply because you had the good taste and put in the effort to buy this hat. Now, I would never buy a Supreme hat and I would never wear a Supreme hat because it's not for me. Mm -hmm. But they're very specific about who it's for. And if you go to their store and watch the 100 people waiting in line, it's really obvious who it's for. And as long as their streak keeps going, 
it will keep going because they are making a promise and they are keeping a promise. And and that is something all of us can lift up and apply to our own work, no question. And I dug into that in the book in my own work, in our own work. And um, I, it's incredibly powerful. It's very, very helpful way to think about it in such a basic way, but such a powerful way. Yeah. I mean, you're a public speaker, a dynamic, successful public speaker. And when you're standing on stage, I'm going to guess here, 7% of the people in the audience are bored checking their phone, and you're not making an impact on them. Now, that 7% is among the lowest in the whole industry. There's almost no one who has a number that low, but let's assert for a minute that's your number. The question is, when you're up there, should you be working super hard to persuade those 7% to put down their phone, or should you be there for the people who are there for you? Right. Should you figure out how to engage with people who are enrolled in the journey you told them you're going on? to push them even further, even if it means leaving behind the folks who want to be left behind. Well, for me, it's obviously the second one. Sure. And the people who get uptight about the first one aren't making an impact in the world. Mm-hmm. I love it. That's so true. And 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 you talk about that. And I was going to ask you, you know, Seth, you, you're not into data and metrics and not into the masses. So how do you measure the impact you make. Oh, I'm very into data. I'm just not into easily measurable data. Got it. Okay. Okay. I'm super glad you're bringing this up. And I, I hint at this in the book. If you have a million Twitter followers, right. are you more impactful, powerful, useful, and beloved than someone with 10,000 Twitter followers? Answer, we don't know. Insufficient data. All we know is we have two easy to measure numbers that don't measure anything. Mm-hmm. So- I am really focused on, did I get deep enough under someone's skin that they actually did something generous for their community? Did I teach someone who was so moved by what I taught that they taught someone else? And if those things are happening, then I can get tons of anecdotal data Mm -hmm. that lets me know that it's working. And then there are other times when I'll bring an idea to the world that I really love where it doesn't accomplish that. And I'll walk away from it because I was wrong. Right, because you want to know the kind of change you're making. And if you have a million Twitter followers, but you're not making a change, that doesn't matter to you. If you have 10,000, you're making a change. I get it. I love it. Any metric you can buy is probably not a good metric. Got it. Right. One of the concepts in the book you talk about is emotional labor. Can you kind of give an example of what that looks like in action for people, for our listeners? So let's agree that Physical labor is easy to understand, right? That sure. You can tell the difference between someone who was lazy all day and someone who did physical labor. That people who don't do physical labor don't need Ben Gay, right? Physical labor is really clear. Emotional labor is the labor of doing something you don't feel like. So if you've been smiling all day in your job as a receptionist, but you feel like you're dying inside, that is emotional labor. Got it. If, right. if you're a flight attendant who doesn't scream at an annoying kid on the airplane who's been <laughs> bothering you for four hours, that's emotional labor. And most of the people who are listening to this do emotional labor for a living. That's what we get paid for. That's why it's not a hobby. Because if it was fun all the time, they wouldn't need to pay us because there'd be a long list of people who want to do it. It's not fun all the time because we have, as a professional, to show up even when we don't feel like it. And the emotional labor that a marketer brings to the table is the empathy of saying, I don't want what you want. I don't care about what you care about. I don't know what you know, but I'm going to bend over backwards to make this something you want to embrace because your success matters to me. That's emotional labor. So what would you tell the person that feels as if they're living a life that has extreme emotional labor, right? So that takes a lot of human energy to have to smile all day as a receptionist when you don't want to smile or when you're a flight attendant and you don't want to yell at the kid. That takes a lot of emotional labor. I would argue that that isn't sustainable. What do you tell those people? So there's a, there's a school of thought that says we need authenticity right. in our work and that you should expose your true self. Well, I think this is nonsense because you don't go to work naked just because you're you know, a little <laughs> sweaty today. And you don't tell off every single person who walks in just because you're in a bad mood. I think we can all agree that that's not appropriate or helpful. 
So everyone's doing a little bit of emotional labor all the time. The question then is how much emotional labor is too much emotional? Right. And my answer is, is it getting you what you want? As a professional, as a parent, as somebody in the world, this work you're doing, is it using you up or is it fueling and feeding your dreams? So if this work as a receptionist enables you to save the money you need to be able to put yourself through medical school so that you can become a doctor in Haiti, well, then I would say to that woman, good for you. That is your best path to get to where you want to go. We call it labor for a reason because it's never been fun. But on the other hand, if you're having trouble ignoring sunk costs and you're stuck in a job because you don't have the guts to imagine a better one, then I would say do the emotional labor of getting out of this job. Get it over with all at once. That life is too short to spend 45 years smiling at a job because you don't have the guts to quit. But if you are doing human work, original work, and generous work, you deserve to get paid more than the minimum wage. And if you put the effort in, you can probably find a different kind of work that will feed your soul at the same time that the emotional labor you're doing is appreciated by those around you. To talk about marketing tactics for a minute, you know, you talk to me about the importance of distinguishing between brand marketing and direct marketing and how we should treat each. So as soon as you're on the internet, you're in a new world and it's a world where you can trade money for attention as a marketer. That in the old world, if you have a plumbing supply store or a bakery, Maybe you have an ad in the yellow pages, but you're not running a lot of ads. But as soon as you go online, you can spend a dollar, ten dollars, twenty dollars at a time. You can boost something on Facebook, you can run Google ads, mm -hmm. et cetera. Sure. And a lot of small business people have been frustrated by how that the whole thing works. And the reason is they don't understand that a brand can be built in one of two ways. Either you're doing what I call brand marketing, which means absolute vodka ads in the New Yorker magazine, which means billboards by the side of the road, which means the neon light in front of your store. <laughs> People pass by, they see it, but they don't call you in that moment. You are present and building a reputation. And the other extreme, direct marketing, which was named and developed by my friend Lester Wonderman 50 years ago, is measured marketing. I ran this ad, I got 50 clicks. Those 50 clicks turned into 10 inquiries. Those 10 inquiries turned into a sale. I can measure it. So it's direct between me and the person who I'm selling to. So if you're busy buying ads online, if you're investing more than a little bit of money on your website, you're a direct marketer. But if you're not measuring, then you're a fool. Because what you're doing is you're spending money without knowing what works and what doesn't. But the internet, which is not a mass medium, it's a micro medium, is the most measured medium ever. So if you figure out how to spend $5 to get $10 worth of business, you can do that all day long and grow as big as you want because you can keep buying those ads for five and they'll pay off at 10. Mm -hmm. Right, but you better measure it. Exactly. And so I have done direct marketing. I'm in the Direct Marketing Hall of Fame. I know what direct marketing is like. But there are plenty of times when I don't do any direct marketing at all because the product or service I'm bringing to the world doesn't lend itself to this sort of measurement. So, you know, this book, this book isn't going to sell because I bought Google ads. It's going to sell because I have a permission relationship with a lot of people. And some of those people will tell their friends. I won't know that they're telling their friends. I can't measure that. Right. But if you wrote it to spread and you did a good job, it will spread. And that's a different kind of marketing than direct marketing. Mm -hmm. Don't confuse the two. Right. You know, you said permission, and you talk a lot about permission-based marketing and, and earning trust. You know, at the same time, you're known for making a ruckus, which I love. How do these two approaches work together for you? Earning trust, making a ruckus, and gaining permission. These are brilliant questions. We didn't practice this at all. Thank you for <laughs> doing so much work here. Um, permission marketing says that anticipated, personal, and relevant messages will always do better than spam. It says that if people would miss you if you are gone, you are way more likely to be able to be trusted with their attention. So this is an asset. It's one of the only assets that can be built online. So my blog has a million readers. 
many of them read the blog every day, so I have the ability to whisper to people who want to hear from me. The question is, why on earth would anyone give their permission to a marketer? Well, I can think of a lot of reasons, right? You might give your permission to a brand like Supreme so you can find out when the next product comes out. You might give your permission to a celebrity so you can find out when they're going to next be in town or when their movie's coming out. You might give your permission to someone who's offering you coupons every once in a while. There's lots of places we offer permission. But one of the most fun ways and most engaging ways to earn permission is to be interesting. Because if you're interesting and generous, people want to hear from you. Well, another definition for being interesting and generous is to make a ruckus. You know, the monkeys had a TV show. They had uh, a couple top 40 hits in the 60s. But no one goes to see the monkeys. Bob Dylan was famous at the same period of time. And he has active, vibrant fan clubs online and a permission base. Why? Because no one knows what Dylan's going to do next. So it's worth following if you're that kind of fan because it's interesting. So that's the path. The path now, because each of us is a marketer, anyone with a social media account is a marketer, the path is to choose to be a serial ruckus maker who's working in service of those you seek to serve. And you're earning their trust. Tell me how you earn their trust. The only way I know to earn trust is you make a promise and you keep it. Yeah, okay. And if you keep making promises and keep keeping promises, the amount of trust you have goes up. What do you think are the biggest traps marketers fall into? I mean, you've studied this, you've delivered against this for decades. The biggest trap is really obvious. Uh, Marketers are short-term, narcissistic, selfish egomania. (laughs) How do you really feel? Well, so... You know, if I'm not careful, I'll become one too. It's there's all this pressure to keep the promises you made to your boss. There's all this pressure when you work hard on something to reach one more person. There's all this pressure to say, I don't want to walk away from this because it's working. But please, can't I just help get the word out? And so we see evidence of this when someone does a Kickstarter. They, you know, there's 20 days left in the Kickstarter. They've only sold $12 worth of stuff. So what do they start doing? They start spamming the world. Every person they know, please blog me. Please write about me because my Kickstarter, my Kickstarter is not going to work. Well, I get it. I get that you worked hard to build that Kickstarter. The mistake you made was you skipped the first seven years of earning trust and permission so that when you did a Kickstarter, it would work. And so you get trapped thinking you have to do this in a hurry instead of thinking you have to earn it. Do you have any advice for someone who's, you know, you think about earning trust and you said seven years, which, which I get. And so in an organization where they launch new verticals, they launch new opportunities to serve their customers in a different way. How do you advise businesses to approach that big and small? Well, we'll start with big, you know, if Nike launched a hotel, I feel like their brand would enable that to work, that we could, each of us, visualize what a Nike hotel would be like. And the kind of person that would like a Nike hotel would probably hear about the Nike hotel and go. But if Nike launched a mouthwash, I don't think that would work because we don't know what a Nike mouthwash would be like and we don't trust Nike to make a mouthwash. So when someone owns a brand, which is a promise in graphics, a promise in word, that brand can only be extended so far and then it stops working. If you're a small organization, it's simpler because your promise is to a known group of people. This known group of people, your customers, they're the only ones that matter. And this is why the sign under new management is so stupid. (laughs) Because what you're saying to the old people who are happy is, "Uh uh-oh, better be careful. It's not the place it used to be. And what you're saying to the new people who aren't, who were never happy is, well, keep on driving because you didn't like this place before and you were right, but it's probably not going to like it now either. So under new management doesn't do you any good. What does you good is to be able to say to your core base, you expected we were going to make Y. Now we make Z. We care enough about this to make it. Do you trust us enough to try it? And if you've earned that privilege, then you're going to get that trial. You know, Seth, I want to talk a little bit about fear for a minute, and specifically fear of change. Um, You talk a lot about this, a little bit about this in the book. And 
and I too believe that that fear can be a real blocker in in our lives. Um, how do you advise people to push beyond it? I don't think you can get rid of the fear. Uh, the example I'll give you is the Boston Marathon. People who finish the Boston Marathon, without exception, are tired. But none of them go to their running coach and say, could you teach me how to run a marathon without getting tired? Because it's given that they're going to be tired. The people who quit at mile 21 are also tired. Their problem is they don't know where to put the tired. And because they don't know where to put the tired, they're trapped. Well, I think the same thing then is true here. When you feel like making a difference in doing emotional labor and creating and connecting and causing change to happen, you are probably afraid. And if you are waiting for the fear to go away, I have to tell you the fear is not going to go away. It can't go away. But what you could do is learn to dance with it. You could view the fear as a compass. You could welcome the fear. You could embrace the fear. And you could say, great, let's sit down and have tea because I've got some work to do in a minute. Mm -hmm. And if you can treat the fear with kindness, what you discover is it's not as horrible as you might have expected. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I used to always say and still do is that, you know, my athletes, when they would step out on the mound and, and, and pitch in Game 7 of a World Series, they felt fear just like we do. They, it's the 21 mile. They lean into it, right? They step into that. They dance with it. They have tea with it, as you said. They embrace it. And we get better when we do that. Either that or we get sent to the minor leagues. But that's what, <laughs> that's the fork in the road. <laughs> that's true. And so, you know, the, part of the argument of this is marketing is every person who reads it will have every tool that I have. Same computer programs, same technology, it's all available to everyone. Nike, someone running for office, you, me, anyone, all have the same internet. So given that massive opportunity that's never been available before, Right, like I will never be allowed to attend a Yankees scouting event. I just can't get in. Right here, anyone can get in. It's all open. So, since the tool is there, the question is: if you feel like pitching, you better start pitching. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. probably beat that analogy to death. No, but I love it. But you, you know, the only thing I would say is that you may go to the minor leagues, but the next time you're in that situation, whether it's in the minor leagues or the big leagues, you maybe we'll handle a little bit, little bit differently because you've built a little endurance around leaning into fear. Exactly. Well said. So we all face difficult decisions where, you know, it feels like we lose no matter what options we choose, right? What's the process for moving forward when facing tough decisions? How do you deal with it? You know, you blogged on this a while ago and I thought it would be powerful to share and to talk about the blog about facing difficult decisions that you, that you wrote. I don't know if you can remember all 7,000, but I actually do remember. you appear to be incredibly bright, so I'm assuming you can. I also have Google, so that helps. Yeah. But um, here's the deal. There's a difference between commiserating, feeling sorry for ourselves, mourning the fact that we have to face options that all suck, that we have to face unfairness. That's a given. So spend a lot of time on that, as much time as you want, kicking the wall, writing letters to the editor, being upset, being sad, got it. Now we're on to step two. Step two is, okay, so that happened. Given that that happened, what will you do now? And what will you do now is a future-facing question that has nothing to do with what happened yesterday. What will you do now is empowering because what it does is it gives you a future back. And I know that you've dealt with this because you deal with athletes all the time. So the athlete has the injury that ends her career. The athlete gets cut for the last time. Okay, that happened. You're 33. What are you going to do now? Mm -hmm. And the fact that you played in a World Series game is irrelevant. It happened, but it, it's over. You can't have it happen again. Mm -hmm. So given that that's your background, what will you do now? Whole new decision mm -hmm. based on whole new information. Sure. Sure. You know, another blog I love that really hit home with me is, is, is about doing the difficult work of the non-urgent. How can we help people make that shift? So let's go back to the thing you and I talked about 15 minutes ago, which is the idea of emotional labor. If you're a professional, then why are you complaining about the fact that you don't get to do the thing you want to do at all times? Of course you don't. You're a professional. So it may be fun 
for you to clear your email, but there's something important that's better to work on than that thing that's urgent. So I'm not good at giving people a list of 12 habits that can help them shift from the urgent to the important. What I'm trying to do is put up a black and white sign or a red and yellow sign on the side of the desk that says, if you want to be a professional, act like one. And what professionals do is emotional labor. And it's hard, I think, today when we live in a world where so much is coming at us, it takes discipline, doesn't it? This is good. This is so good that it's hard. Right. The reason it's good is because everyone else is distracted and you're not. Right, Because you understand this is your work. Where do you see the biggest shift or disruption happening in the next one to three years? Well, I think in the short run, what we're seeing is that freelancers are discovering that freelancing can be a race to the bottom if you're willing to take any gig. And we're seeing that if you're a retailer, uh, as Steve Dennis says, average is dangerous because Amazon's better than you at being average. Mm -hmm. So the combination (laughs) of those two means that the way many of us spend our time, either doing work for someone else or selling something, are being completely transformed. And this is the window where you have to dig in and instead become the one and only, where there is no easy substitute. And I wish there was an easy way to do that, but there isn't. Well, you can do it by making a ruckus, earning trust, and yeah, it's permission. straightforward. It's just not easy. Okay, so Seth, we end with rapid fire. So I'm gonna fire off some questions and uh, just tell me what comes up. Okay, I'm ready. All right. So one word to describe you. Well, one person tweeted that I was insufferable. <laughs> Do you agree with that? Well, he's right. Everyone's right. Everyone's right about their opinion of everybody else. So it's not for me to say that in his point of view, I'm not insufferable because I probably am. So how would you describe you? How about optimistic? All right. What's the last book you read? The last book. See, I'm in the middle of 18 different books. I'm reading this great book last night on fermentation, the most detailed, uh, loving book on fermentation ever (laughs) written. It sounds just so compelling. Well, it's good bedtime reading. Okay. What's a book that has had the greatest impact on you? There are a bunch, but I usually point out The Art of Possibility by Ben and Roz Zander. It's a book I listen to again every three months, whether I need it or not, but I always need it. Mm, Okay. What's a brand you love and why? There's a summer camp north of Toronto called Camp Arawan, and it's where I grew up and ran it one summer in 1990. And what it stands for, for me, is possibility. And the idea that an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 15-year-old can learn to do things on their own Mm. because they want to and because they contribute by doing so. And I've been trying to recreate that vibe in my work life ever since. Oh, that's cool. What's your favorite app? Well, the app I use the most is email. Don't send me email. It's my addiction. That's a really bad habit of mine. Um, in terms of the ones that make me smile when I use them, uh, I probably get the most uh, pleasure out of a program called Macromedia Freehand that's now obsolete. But the one that I use daily is called Keynote. But I don't use it the way they say you should. (laughs) I use it to present and think through all of my ideas graphically. Mm. I wish they would stop making it worse, so I use a four-year-old version of it. What is your biggest pet peeve? See, the problem with peeves is they make lousy pets. Yeah, that's a good one. What else? I think uh, bad design when um, someone forgot to ask who is this for, it really Mm -hmm. gets under my skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's the person you'd most like to meet? Well, I haven't met you in person yet, Molly. I know. Well, it's, hey, I'm on the next airplane, man. It'd be my honor. All right. Let me know when you're in town. I'm on it. Okay, so the show is called Game Changer. So one last question for you. What game changer inspires you and why? The people who inspire me every single day are the ones who have so little and whose society hasn't been kind to Mm. who show up and make a generous ruckus anyway. Mm. These are the people uh, who are working in the slums of Kibera or the people who didn't get the right kind of education in Chicago or the people who have a fancy job, but don't let that get in the way of doing work that matters. Mm. And all I have to do is look at that. And then I'm back to my work because that's why I do it. 
Seth Godin, you are a gift. You are a gift because you come at it in such a real way and you do work that matters. You make a ruckus and you've made me better. And for that, I thank you. And you make so many other people better. So thank you so much. Holy smokes, you're very kind. It was great to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.